webinar with Mary Lee Adams. I am so excited to host Mary Lee today, and I expect that we are all going to learn so much from her. Mary Lee wrote, people who ask the best questions get the best results everywhere in their lives. She's the author of Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. 10 Powerful Tools for Life and Work. It's an international bestseller. And she's also the author of Teaching That Changes Lives, 12 Mindset Tools for Igniting the Love of Learning. Dr. Adams is the president of the Inquiry Institute. She facilitates workshops, programs, and keynotes internationally for Fortune 100 companies, government agencies, and nonprofits. She is the originator of the Breakthrough Question Thinking Methodologies and is also an adjunct professor of leadership at American University in the School of Public Affairs. Her passion is teaching the thinking, questioning, and communication skills that help people be more successful and satisfied, including when they are facilitating and engaging in change. And uh, one funny thing I know about Mary Lee, because we once shared a taxi ride together from the airport in San Francisco, is that she lives in Lambertville, New Jersey. Now, I live in Lambertville, Michigan. So it's funny coincidence. I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to learn from Mary Lee today. I know that you're going to learn a lot. So before we begin, a couple of notes. We would love to invite you to live tweet this event. You can use the hashtag ChangeYourQuestions. You can also uh, use Mary Lee's Twitter handle, at Mary Lee Adams. We're also going to be accepting questions throughout the presentation and using a few polls. And so for a quick minute, if you want to test out the uh, question panel and tell us where you're calling in from, we'd love to know where you're calling in from. We have over 300 people who signed up to be a part of today's event. Now the other thing I want to let you know is that at the end of the event, I'm going to share more with you about a one-day event that Mary Lee is facilitating next month in New Jersey. And so I want you to make sure you stay until the end so that you'll have a chance to hear more about that. So um, Mary Lee, I'm going to let you talk just to let you know so far I see that we have folks calling in from Canada, from Arizona, from Florida, from Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Wyoming, Las Vegas, New York, Boca Raton, Alaska, Seattle, North Carolina, Ohio, Michigan. People, uh, we just have a caller who typed in that he's calling in from New Zealand. So we've got a great group with us today. And Becky, it's really so exciting to be here and to have the opportunity to share with people what we're learning about resilience and change agents and what it takes to really be successful on every level, not just with the change, but personally as the change agent. And it's funny, when you and I were talking uh, yesterday about the webinar, you asked me about the kind of international reception to the material and change your questions, change your life. And it was fun to be able to tell you that, uh, first of all, the book is all over the world. It's in, I think, 20 languages. But the, um, what was most impressive to me happened last November when I spent a whole month in Asia, in, in Malaysia, Singapore, and Beijing, and had the opportunity to keynote about this material and run workshops about it, including um, speaking to a conference in Beijing to about 300 companies. Most of them were HR people and um, change change agent people. And that was, for me, really interesting because it was the first time I ever presented when I was being translated. So it was an all Chinese audience. And wow. it was really great. And what was so gratifying and really reinforcing for me was even when it was in Chinese, it was obvious that people were getting it. It was obvious during the, the uh, keynote and then afterwards when I spoke to people and they asked me questions about their organizations and about change and uh, the concepts really, really resonated. And in fact, I'll be going back to um, uh, Beijing and also to Hong Kong later this year. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to present this material that is really making a difference in so many different places. When we came up with the term resilient change agent, it was obvious that it really hit a chord with, um, with people on our, on our, um, 
on our email list with colleagues in courses, in, in um, presentations that I've given, even at um, American University where I teach that leadership course. And um, what it comes down to is in the world of intentional change, and this is true now more than at any time in history, we know a lot about change processes, change systems, and change models. And that's true for individuals, for teams, and organizations. We know how to plan it and design it, how to implement it, how to assess and measure it. So you would think with all of this experience that it would always work. And of course, we know that it doesn't always work. In fact, change is often a challenge. So it's a challenge in particular for change agents who are the ones who are tasked with um, guiding, navigating, managing change. So before we get more into um, our conversation today, I'd love to get a sense of who's on the call. And Becky, I think you have a way to poll that. I do. I just initiated our poll. You'll see that there are five answers, and you can select all that apply. If for some reason none of those five apply to you, I'd invite you to just type into the question panel so we can get an idea of who's on the call. Um, it looks to me like about 50% It's kind of growing as people are answering. About about half of you are coaches and consultants. It looks like about 40% are learning and leadership development. Continue to, to vote. We'd love to, to get your feedback. I have a couple of people, Marilee, typing in uh, someone in the military, someone mm. who's a nonprofit board member, a senior executive, an employee assistance professional. We also, um, earlier when I pulled about where people were calling in from, I mentioned New Zealand. We also have someone on the call from the Philippines. Oh, great. So um, people are continuing to give their answers to this poll that's in progress, and we have lots of other feedback coming in on the question panel. So thank you for all of you. We love getting a sense of who's on the call with us and learning together today. And that really helps me, too, so thank you. And so this is a question for all of us to engage in, which is given all the expertise and experience that we have professionally and that's represented by those of you on the call, what could be some of the reasons why change initiatives fail or flounder and what could be missing? So let's take a quick look at some statistics that kind of validate what I just said, that over 70% of change efforts fail, and that's from John Cotter in the Harvard Business Review who is a very well-known writer about change. And in fact, one of his articles, I think it's the one on um, leading change, why transformation efforts fail, is one of the most requested um, Harvard Business Review articles. And then the other point here, and this is, says that the number one obstacle to success for major change projects is employee resistance and the ineffective management of the people side of change. So it's the people side of change. At the same time, I still want to focus on what's missing. And I think that what's missing is even more essential than what we were just pointing to. It's in the realm of the people side of change and yet I think that we really need to focus more on the change agents because we learn as change agents and whatever role or profession we represent, as we learn about change, we focus on the how and the what of change and on the who in terms of people who are being impacted by change, but rarely do we focus on the who of change agents themselves? And by that I mean the being of the change agent, which means the skills, morale, endurance, our capacity to bounce back and bring ourselves to each situation in a positive, productive mindset moment by moment. So, I mean, the question is really, what does it actually take to be successful as we live the life of a change agent every day and even in every conversation and in every moment. So 
so that leads us to um, today's objective, and that is to provide some answers and possibilities about a game changer advantage for change agents in leading or managing change. And um, I'd like to remind you of the questions that were on the announcement that we sent out about this webinar. And it, it starts with that one thing about um, a game changer advantage. So we said, are you looking for a game changer advantage for leading or managing change? Are you and your colleagues having trouble finding ways to prevent burnout and also strengthen resilience while also achieving desired results? And do you want to be more successful and satisfied in the face of challenges, resistance, ambiguity, and setbacks? So what I hear from many change agents is that they feel weary and burned out, sometimes confused and conflicted, that they never expected managing change to be so hard or for change to take so long or for change to take so much out of them. So that's what I hear in conversations. And what I'm curious about is whether that resonates for um, people, those of you who are on the call. And so, Becky, we have another poll here. I'm ready to launch it, Marilee. Here we go. Okay. okay. Again, this one has five answers, and people can select as many as they would like or as many as they feel apply. And if for some reason one of these doesn't quite get to the heart of what you think, feel free to use the change the question panel again to type in your thoughts. So some answers are starting to come in. Um, so far, the one that has the most results is uh, the third reply, not enough alignment between those who design and those who implement is supposed to be at the end. Mm -hmm. um, we were putting these polls together at the very last hour. So I know getting input is important, but what kind and when, let me see if I can find the end of that answer what kind and when is confusing. My apologies on that. There's a limit to the number of um, characters, and we were uh, rushing to get those in at the last minute. So the, second, uh, the third one should be not enough alignment between those who design and those who implement. And the fifth one should be, I know getting input is important, but, but what, what kind, kind of and when is, what kind of input and when is confusing. So uh, by far, the largest number of responses that we're getting, Mary Lee, is for that third reply, that there's not enough alignment between those who design the change and those who are asked to implement the change. And sometimes in the vernacular, we call that a pain point because it leads to such complications and such challenges. Um, the cost of these kinds of struggles that I was pointing to and that those of you on the call who just took the poll are really pretty staggering that if 75 if 70 percent or so of change initiatives do not work and that the struggles the daily struggles are really onerous um, then the cost of this is really huge. And it's not just in terms of the success of the change initiative. It's not just in terms of the money on the table, which is very large. It's also in relation to the mission of organizations and the, to the toil of human beings who are both impacted by the change, trying to initiate the change. So it's really like a um, ripple in a pond. When change is difficult and when we don't know really how to manage ourselves well in the face of it, then it becomes more and more difficult and less and less successful. So um, at the end of the day, in terms of our goal, 
for today, which is to provide answers and possibilities about a game changer advantage. For us at the Inquiry Institute, that game changer advantage has to do with each person's capacity and skill in being able to manage ourselves in the face of whatever challenge we're facing at any given point. So I'd like to give a kind of a personal example of a, t a point where I ran into a difficulty and then what it took for me to manage myself out of it. And this is a um, situation where I was in a team meeting and the person who was leading the team was, I would say, objectively doing a very poor job of leading this meeting. And I could tell that people were getting restless and I could see people writing notes to each other about what a poor job she was doing and kind of snickering. And I sat back and watched all this and then I found myself getting very judgmental about the people who were being judgmental about the team leader. And all of a sudden, I, I stepped back in my mind and said, oh my goodness, Marilee, you're being judgmental about people who are being judgmental. How is this going to help? And of course, it's not. So then I really had to ask myself, given the situation and given my commitment to this, this meeting going well and this project going well, what could I do right now that could make a difference? And that was a question that really helped shift me from being in a judgmental kind of mindset to a, a productive kind of mindset. And so what happened after that is I started asking some questions to the leader that kind of helped her get back on track and also let her know that somebody was on her side in this meeting. And as she uh, responded positively to that, then the judgmental uh, nature of the meeting for everybody else started to turn around and people started uh, engaging in a way that was positive and productive what it took to make that change in that meeting started inside me with the ability to observe myself and then decide, oh, there is something that I could do about that and then to actually do it. So what I'm referring to here is a personal mindset shift or switch. And what we've discovered is that the mindsets that we operate in make a huge difference moment to moment in our, in our success, in our satisfaction, in our ability to collaborate, in our ability to, to be positive, and that a lot of times people really do not know that um, they have two different mindsets and they don't know how to observe them and therefore don't have a predictable way to choose the mindset that's going to be most helpful at any particular point. So what I'd like to do with, the, um, with all of you on the call right now is give you a, a little experience of what I'm describing and, um, and then we'll take it from there. And this is very simple. I'm simply going to describe or recite two sets of questions. And I'm going to recite them in first person singular, or what I call question thinking. So you can listen to them as if you were asking them of yourself. Remembering that the questions we ask ourselves are expressions of our mindsets and our mindsets are expressions of the questions we ask ourselves. So discovering the questions becomes part of a game changer advantage because only when you discover them 
and name them, can you really do something about them? So here is the first set of questions. What's wrong with me? Why do I always have such bad luck? How did I get stuck with this boss or this colleague or this person that I'm managing? Why do I get stuck with being the champion of change that I don't even necessarily agree with? Why are all these people around me so stupid and clueless? Haven't we already been there, done that? Why bother? Now, I've asked that set of questions to literally thousands of people. And here is what usually happens. First, when I'm in, an, in person with people so I can see them, I notice that many people have stopped breathing. So the first thing is, if you stop breathing, please start again. Uh, but sometimes people literally say those questions take the breath out of me. And when I ask them about the impact of those questions, they'll say things like, it was a downer, or I felt like a victim, or I got a headache, or a stomach ache. I mean, people literally say that after, what, 30 seconds of the questions. Or um, my energy has just gone away. My self-confidence has just gone away. I don't feel like um, talking to anybody. And people will even say they get, well, I said downer, but even a little bit depressed and um, kind of resigned. So um, you can just simply note to yourself if some of what I said rings a chord for you if it was um, something that you experienced when I recited those questions. Before I recite another set of questions, the other set, uh, I would ask that you take a nice deep breath and exhale and kind of make yourself present for a different set of questions that has a very different intention and um, set of pre presuppositions behind it. So, Marilee, yes. do we by chance have a slide change to the questions that you just asked and the next set of questions? I um, wasn't sure. No. Mm -mm. Okay, I'm, we don't have a slide. Okay, just checking. <laughs> I, at, right after it, I'm going to, um, after this set of questions, then the next one is about the mindset summary. Okay, perfect. Just checking. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes. So here is the second set of questions. What do I want for both myself and others? What is useful or valuable about this situation? What is the other person or people, what are they thinking, feeling, and wanting? What are some of the most valuable steps forward that I could take? How can I make this work and help other people make it work? And what's possible? So what people say about the second set of questions is almost the opposite of the first, that they can breathe, that they start feeling more optimistic rather than pessimistic, that they feel like there are options and possibilities, that there is actually a different future that's possible. Um, in the first set of questions, it's more, the future is more like a repetition of the past. Um, in the, with the second set of questions, people say they feel energized, they feel ready for action, ready to collaborate with people, and kind of ready to get going. So um, the next slide that Becky was referring to is the Learner Judger Mindset Summary. So we're going to call the first set of questions judger questions, and judger questions come from judger mindsets. And the second set of questions we're going to call learner questions, and learner questions from, come from 
a learner mindset. And the important thing to remember is that every one of us has both mindsets, and both mindsets are normal. So that's really important to remember. So when we are in our learner mindset, we tend to be more open-minded, curious, creative, collaborative, flexible, and resilient. And when we're in our judger mindsets, we tend to be more closed-minded, critical, I'm going to say in there judgmental, inflexible, and reactive. And the point is that our mindsets shift sometimes moment by moment. So usually when I can see people, I'll say, um, how many of us ask those judger questions? And then I say, everybody should be raising your hands because we all do. And then I'll say, how many of us ask learner questions? And of course, everybody raises their hand because we all do. And then the point is, if we all have judger mindsets and judger questions, and we all have learner mindsets and learner questions, then what's the big deal? What's the point? Well, the point is that at when we have the ability to observe which questions and which mindset is in charge, simultaneously we have the ability to switch from one mindset to another. So it comes down to a kind of four-point process that when we can observe the mindset we're in, that's number one. Number two, when we can analyze it for effectiveness, like what mindset is it? And if we're in judger, how is that going to impact our effectiveness? When we have the ability to recraft our questions and move into a different mindset, and then when we have the ability and the courage to ask questions and operate from that mindset, then we have a way that's actually a reliable method that we can use in every moment. So I'd like to show everybody a visual of what I've just described, and that is the choice map. Um, the choice map is a summary of the learner and judger mindsets, and many say a very, very useful one. And what it shows is that when, if you look at the slide and the figure, kind of an action figure on the left side of the slide, and it's, it looks like it's thinking, and it's standing on a start button. And most of us have heard the expression, it's not what happens to us, it's what we do next that matters. So this figure that's standing on the start button, something has just happened to it. So it's been, he or she has been impacted by some circumstance or some thought or feeling. Then the question is, what do we do next? So what I'm adding to that usual um, phrase is that what happens next is typically we go either judger or we go learner. And frankly, judger is the default position. And the simple reason is, is because we're hardwired for judger. And when we feel fearful or threatened or worried, uh, judger mindset tends to take over. And then, as you can see on the visual, the first typical judger question is, well, whose fault is it? And then we're kind of off to the races. And then you can see in the next um, questions, there, there are questions focused on myself, what's wrong with me, or focused on others. So that's how we think, what's wrong with me or what's wrong with them. Obviously, those are blame-seeking um, questions. And then we keep traveling down the judger path, and we end up in um, what, what people I know call, they say, this is the famous judger pit. And when I poll people about, um, has anybody here never been in the judger pit? And basically, people just laugh, because of course, we all have. 
so then if you go up to the questions on the on the um, learner path, you can see that those questions are really, really different. What happened? What are the possibilities? What do I want to do now? What am I responsible for? So the first lesson of this visual is that at any moment, we could be taking one or the other of this path. And just simply looking at the choice map helps us observe what path we're on. What makes the choice map really practical is um, the, the switching questions that go after it. So let's first go back to um, some to just make a, a, a point about the learner mindset, that the learner mindset is the habit curiosity and courage of asking open-minded questions of oneself and others. And then um, putting that in the context of change. I've written here that facilitating change is best done from learner mindset. However, the conditions and challenges of change promote judge your thinking, feeling, and expressing. And that's usually true both for change agents and everyone else who is impacted by change. Or um, sometimes when I kind of make a, judge, a, a, a joke about it, I'll say to people, when it comes to change, it's kind of a judge or jungle out there. And the point is, how do we see ourselves through? So Becky. Um, it's possible that people have some questions or some comments at this point before I take it further. So yes, there are lots of questions and comments <laughs> oh, good. That can come in. <laughs> would you pick um, one or two I or would, a few? I would be glad to. So um, I'm going to start with this one because it came in as you were wrapping up about the judge or jungle. Uh, we had a question that came in from Julie, and she's asking, how do I get off the judge or path? Oh, that's the big question. Um, Julie, the next thing that we're going to go to is looking at the switching lane and the switching questions. And that, in fact, is the method or the method that we're working with that makes switching um, predictable. So we'll get to some more detail about that in a moment. And um, thank you for asking the question that I get most often, because it's what we all care about. Exactly. Well, here's another question to follow up, um, Marilee, that's about judger. So you use the term judger, but sometimes we have opinions and we have to make judgments in order to be effective, don't we? So can you speak a little bit to that? Oh, absolutely. So um, there is a big distinction between making judgments, which we have to do, and being judgmental. And when I refer to judger mindset, it's judgmental that I'm referring to. And some dictionary definitions of judgmental. One is wearing blinders that don't admit into evidence anything we don't already agree or like or want. So that's the place where we have tunnel vision and people say facts, what facts? So, um, it's, so being judgmental means having tunnel vision. And another dictionary definition is um, we, can, we can be judgmental to ourselves. We can be judgmental to others. So in other words, judger has two faces, but the cognitive operation is the same, which is being critical and judgmental. So the ways that we can tell, or usually, is that we feel defensive or we feel angry um, or if other people are, those are some of the signs of being in judge or mindset. So is insisting on being right, not really listening to other people, uh, things like that. Got it. Okay, so um, another question, slightly different from Dana, says change can occur as a threat. So people's response could be normal in how it occurs to them. How would you cause a shift in the point of view from threat to possibility? Oh, great question. Well, mm, I uh, so too. <laughs> well, they're all good questions. Um, ch 
change is often experienced that way. That doesn't mean it actually is a threat. However, um, most of us have been in organizations where change has not worked well. And you know, sometimes this goes under the title of resistance. I, I personally don't like that term that much because when people feel threatened by change, it's real and it's personal. And so they really don't know um, what that change is going to mean for them. And it could be, uh, I mean, really, we don't know. Does it mean we're going to lose our jobs? We're going to lose our titles? We're going to lose our responsibility? We're going to lose our colleagues? We're going to lose our office? So there's a lot of potential loss and particularly in a situation where there isn't a lot of information. You know, human beings tend to fill in what we don't have, and usually what we fill in is not positive. So lacking information or lacking a poorly communicated change initiative, people are left on their own to worry and wonder. So I think that's completely normal. So then so one of the ways to help a shift would be to give more information to people about the change that's happening? Well, yeah, but also if you're the person experiencing it, and um, most of the time we are, because even if we are um, helping implement somebody else change, that doesn't mean we have all the information. So there, there's kind of an external and an internal response to that. One is get more information. and discover that information in as much of a learner way as possible because you'll be more open-minded and ask questions that bring in um, more of the full view of what's happening. And this isn't do it just once because oftentimes change initiatives are announced and then they keep changing how the initiative is going to go. So we need to keep ourselves updated with what's going on and that requires feeling comfortable enough to um, ask questions and to ask them in the right way. So that's the first part of it. But the second part is managing ourselves. So that's part of the switching is, OK, I notice that I'm upset or angry. Um, what can I do to feel calmer? And this is where. Um, moving into switching questions, which we're going to go into in a minute, becomes a predictable tool for managing oneself. And I'd like to emphasize that this is not a one-time thing. It could be minute to minute to minute. That's a really good point, Marilee. Thank you for that. So I'm not sure. We have four or five more great questions. I don't know if you want to hold them to make sure that you have time to complete your content or if you want to take one or two more right now. I think I'm going to go into switching questions and um, then give some context and a tool that is helpful for switching. And, um, and then we'll open it up for some more questions. And I can do it pretty quickly. OK, so, sounds great. So if you. Um, think back to the choice map and you see there is a switching lane. And it says, the sign says switch to avoid judge or um, pit, ask switching questions or learning questions. And so it's so fascinating to me because my own experience in doing this for myself, and of course it always begins with ourselves, and also in working with others, is that Sometimes you can actually have a, phys a physiological shift in moving from um, judger to learner, which was what the point that I was making in the story that I told um, about 10 minutes ago, that I had to make that switch internally before I could behave differently with my colleagues in that meeting. And that's where it always starts with ourselves. So the first judger, the first switching question is simply, am I in judger? And of course, the point is to ask that non-judgmentally. You're, you're looking for information. Uh, is this what I want to be feeling or doing? Um, where I am, is this where I want to be? 
And one of my favorite questions is, how else can I think about this? And asking questions, I, uh, switching questions, I think is being think of as being the operational core of moving from one mindset to another, of moving from a place of upset and maybe calamity into a place of um, being able to see more broadly, of being more flexible, just like that other slide, of having more options, of um, getting back our own personal equanimity and flexibility, because that's what we need to be the most agile and current in terms of how we're managing change moment by moment by moment. So switching questions become the operational heart of internal change, personal change. And then in, I mean obviously this is just a, a short one hour webinar, but in our longer courses, the day course and even a six month course that we do, it's really about getting um, more skilled and facile with having switching questions be um, really the method that we use over and over. And of course, the more that we do it, the better that we get at it. So um, let's bring up the next slide. The next slide is. So I want to put this whole thing in the context so that, because uh, there are people who have many different roles um, in organizations. So this, this um, it looks like a hubcap or a mandala. Uh, it, it's kind of a summary of the question thinking system and all the tools and resources here. So in the middle, is inquiring mindset or question thinking. An inquiring mindset is really um, okay, learner mindset kind of on steroids. The, the, the inclination and courage to ask open-minded questions of ourselves and others. Around that, it says learner and judger uh, mindsets and question thinking. And that's really the core of the work. I've worked with teams over a whole year and really ended up focusing a lot of the work on shifting from um, actually being a judger team to a learner team. And um, people always laugh when I ask them that. I say, have you ever been on a judger team? And they laugh because they know exactly what I mean. Or a learner team, and of course, they're very different. So it's the mindset work and the questions we ask ourselves and who we are moment to moment that's really at the core. Arrayed around that are a lot of different tools that we use both well with teams, with individuals, with organizations. And you can see that the, um, there are three tools that are more an orange color. Those are mindset tools and the other tools are more in relation to different um, situations and more interpersonal situations and circumstances. The, if so then if you think of the, this wheel as being having a, a bottom and a top, the round circles at the bottom are human processes that we all need to be good at and continually working at. Critical, creative, strategic thinking, uh, decision making and problem solving, information gathering, resolving conflict. These are skills that really are part of leadership, of management, of change management um, all the time. And then up at the top are some um, application areas. So it could be in coaching, it could be in leading, it could be in culture, it could be in running meetings, it could be in IT could be in sales and marketing. And I mean, frankly, it could be anywhere. I was just, when I made this up, I was limited by the real estate. But you could add in just about everything. The point being that you could, if you could rotate those tools, bringing with them, doing them in learner mindset, you could focus almost any of those tools 
on any of those little circles around the perimeter and there would be something useful there. So it would depend, of course, on the situation, the goals, the players, and the resources. At the same time, most of those tools could work in most situations, which means that there's a coherent system with language that people can share and practices that they can share. Because we all know that even if a change initiative were completely roaringly successful, there's still the issue of sustaining change. And I don't believe people sustain change unless they have practices, mindset practices and practices with other people that they can engage in day by day by day. That becomes kind of the, the structure for maintaining change. So um, Becky, let's take a few more questions and then I'm going to provide a tool for people to use as, um, as a help with switching. Sure. Um, so there's a question that came in from Joseph, and he's wondering how he can delicately help someone see that, he, that they are in a judger mindset. <laughs> That's my, the second most usual question. And um, I, I, I actually do have an answer for that, and it's not always a very popular answer. And that is that we really cannot make other people change. And as much as we want to and as much as we might even be right about it. And yet, in any circumstance, we're bringing our own mindset to, this, to, to the interaction. So, Joseph, if you, if you wanted to point out something to someone and you pointed that out when you were in a judger mindset, then the likelihood is that the other person would go deeper into judger because they would be matching judger for judger. In fact, I like to say that um, learner begets learner and judger begets judger. What kind of world do we want to create moment by moment? So the real issue in dealing with other people who may or may not be in judger is to get really resilient in our own learner mindset. And before we have an interaction, we center ourselves there. And the more that we can really build our resilience as learners, then the more uh, flexible and the most options and the most um, inviting we can be to others and the best models that we can be for others. And um, I, I, by the way, please don't think that I'm saying that this is just simple and easy. I think that learning how to develop our own resilience as a learner and also that means developing some immunity to judger, our own judger and others, is one of the most challenging things that people can take on. It's just that it's also one of the most rewarding. Um, Becky, any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the next one that I wanted to ask came, for, came in from Anna, and she's wondering how we can apply the learner mindset across an organization, so at the organizational level. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, most of the time when I'm working with organizations and I've worked with many of the biggest in the world and some of the smallest and also in government and nonprofit. And people will usually laugh and say, well, we have a really judger organization or we have a really judger team. And um, one of the things that I think is always true is what can you do with it within your own scope of control? So if you're talking with an individual, what learner can you bring to that interaction? If you're working with a team, what learner can you bring to that interaction? If you are designing change and implementing change for the whole organization, how can you bring learner to that? Now, many people on this call are familiar with the term learning organization. So if I talk about a learner organization, those things interact really well. And so if we're building a learning organization, then in the hearts and minds of people at all levels, the most salient thing to do is to keep returning ourselves to learner 
because we actually can see differently, we interact differently, the possibilities that are available to us are different. And of course, this is a, leave, a living, breathing phenomena, so it's moment by moment by moment. Great. So here's another great question. Um, McCray is wondering, what are the key factors that create a learner or a judger environment? So merely you are referencing that people will say, you know, this is a, a judge or organization or team, or this is a learner team. What are the factors that contribute to that? Wow. Well, how do I count the ways? <laughs> um, so I'm going to group my response into a couple different categories. One, of course, is that the more that leaders, and I mean leaders at every level, can model learner thinking then and behaving, then the more that that becomes part of the culture. In fact, um, the last chapter of Change Your Questions, Change Your Life is entitled The Inquiring Leader. And that's what I'm referring to there, is the, the, um, the ability and the willingness to keep returning to learner in every situation. So there are also a lot of things that build judger in the culture that are unintentional. In other words, they build judger unintentionally. The judger is a kind of unintended byproduct of um, a lot of things that are in a culture. And one of those things is change. So if change, if it, change um, can rouse judger, even when it's done very well. Uh, but there are other things that rouse judger. So the situation I was describing that I was in, a meeting that was going poorly, if the meeting goes poorly and people don't know how to facilitate successful meetings, then we end up not having an outcome and being pretty judgmental about the meeting, about the person who is leading it, about what we have to do, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes structural things have an unintended byproduct of building, I call it kind of judger sludge in the culture. And if you could kind of imagine in the middle of the floor, we've got, um, well, judger sludge or a judger junk heap. Everything that I'm saying it makes it a little bit higher and makes change more difficult. In fact, I would say the more change there is in the culture, the more it's trying to uh, implement and lead change while you're trying to run through mud. And, and I think a lot of people could identify with that. I think um, not questioning assumptions is a, is a huge contributor. Um, communication that is not clear and timely and accurate can lead to judger. I think that um, the ways that we interact with people, even labeling people in certain ways, leads to judger. Um, I mean, this is, it's a very deep question. And it, uh, I think that there are just so many ways. But I, the main point is that the more judger there is, whether it's sort of intentional, although I don't think that people get judger on purpose. <laughs> I think that that um, it just kind of occurs, and basically because we don't know how to manage it. What I'd like to do, Becky, is go to the next slide. Great. Um, so the next slide is kind of a, I call it the five questions. And this is something that um, people can use anybody can use, I certainly use it, um, for, for getting ourselves, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of switching. So I'm going to read those questions and then we're going to take a poll on um, what are some of your takeaways and um, in kind of in relation to to the five questions and everything else. So the first question is, what do I want for both myself and others? What assumptions am I making? Am I in learner mindset or judger mindset right now? 
am I listening with learner ears or judger ears? And who do I choose to be in this moment? So those questions taken as a group and taken individually can go a long way with helping us develop and, and deeply develop our learner resilience and our ability to be productive and positive and successful in any moment. And sometimes success really just looks like being able to maintain our own equanimity and sometimes success means being able to manage a team or a project in a way that is moving forward. But those are kind of evergreen questions in the sense that we can use them all the time just about anywhere. So um, in terms of what you're taking away from today's uh, conversation, and Becky, we have a poll there. Yes, and I have launched that one. We have uh, the third answer is cut off, but it says the judger mindset gives me a new way to think about resistance. So we again have five different answers. Please select all that apply, and we're looking forward to getting your feedback about your takeaways today. So far, I'm seeing that switching questions are a concrete skill that people think that, that they will use. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> Indeed, 64%. And uh, nearly that many also say the choice map is a useful visual for them. Um, and as we're waiting for more answers to come in, Marilee, I did have a couple of questions um, as you were speaking, wondering about how people can get some of the resources that you shared today, including the choice map and the inquiring mindset graphic. I, at the, I think the final slide has our website on it, inquiryinstitute.com. And so um, I would suggest going to the website because there's a lot of information. And also, if you sign up on the website, then you can receive ongoing uh, newsletters and new articles and things that we're continually providing, including um, workshops, webinars, speaking. Um, Great. We load a lot into it. So is the choice map on the website currently? The choice map is on the website so that people can view it, yes. Perfect. I'm going to close out that poll so we can take a look at your last slide. And also, I'm hoping that you'll share for a few minutes about the upcoming one-day event. Okay. So here's your contact information, the website at inquiryinstitute.com, your Twitter handle, and an email address where folks can contact you. And so tell us about the one-day event, when it is, where it is. And well, the one that's upcoming is in the Princeton area in New Jersey, and it's on April 24th. That's a Thursday, and it's a whole day on the resilient change agent. So we've just touched on some of the aspects of it today. Um, we're going to take all of those much deeper, and then additionally, people will have the opportunity to take a, a change issue that's personal and relevant and timely for them and use the material in the course to work it through so that they have new thinking about an old situation by the end of the day. We'll also be doing that workshop at other cities around the country and then later at some point in webinar form. But the one that's, that's coming up soon is the one on April 24th near Princeton. Okay, fantastic. And we have included the URL where people can get more information about that event. I also want to let everyone on the call know that we'll be sending out some follow-up. We have recorded this event. We uh, will be sending out follow-up so that you can access the recording. And also we'll be sending some more information from Mayor Lee, some resources, and also a link in case you'd like to sign up for the April 24th one-day event. So Mayor Lee, thank you so much for an hour full of learning from all the comments that are coming in. There's a lot of learning. A lot of people are saying thank you. And so from me and from all those who have called in to participate today, thank you so much, Marilee, for sharing your expertise with us. Well, you're quite welcome. And I also urge you, if you want to um, ask more questions or if you want to interact with us about the material or any of the courses or webinars, send us an email or call us. And we would really love to talk with you. So 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone.